So you're listening to the Executive Coach Podcast with me, Maya Goodka, and welcome to the Career Reboot Series. This month, you'll be waking up to a daily curated series of episodes to listen to with your morning coffee, your go-to guides to keeping you motivated, strategic, and able to have fun in your career, especially as some of us might be limping a little bit towards the summer holidays. And as you listen in this month, you might find it useful to have my career blind spots scorecard to hand, which you can download from the link in the show notes. So let's dive into today's episode. Okay, so we are back today with part two of career regrets. And so if you are new around here, you may want to go back and listen to where I talked about career regret. I've been looking at two specific HBR articles, Harvard Business Review articles. They're about a decade apart in publication date. The first one, which we looked at in a bit more detail last time, was by Daniel Gulati, and that was published in 2012. He looked at about 30 professionals. He did some qualitative research with them and identified five top career regret themes, which we looked at last week, examined them and also just offered a few different lenses through which these regrets can be viewed. So definitely go back and have a listen to that. I also planted the seed of your own career regrets and gave you about a week, um, if you were listening last time, to mull over if you have any specific career regrets yourself, differentiating these from the idea of hindsight, which is just having that 2020 vision, knowing how specific risks and decisions can pay off in the future. I'd like to differentiate that from the idea of career regret when we really have a specific regret and remorse around decisions that we took and we wish that we had chosen alternative paths. And this is less about knowing then how the future has unfolded. Um, and so less of an optimization thing and more of a real pathway thing. So the other way to think about it is I gave my example last time of wishing I'd started my podcast 10 years earlier right? I would describe that as more of an optimization thing. The fact is I'm doing a podcast now. I'm pleased I'm doing it. And I obviously wish my podcast all the success. And so if, with that knowledge and with that understanding, yes, it may have been more optimal to start earlier. That's different from almost saying that, you know, looking back over my entire career and having a regret that it was something I always really wanted to do and never actually did it. So thinking about my own, because I did promise that I would have a, a little thing, the one that I realized I do talk about quite a lot is wishing that I had studied medicine. There's a few different reasons for this. One is that I think it's a really open degree to do in terms of then whatever other careers you want to do. So the fact that I then went into banking and financial services, I think medicine would have offered me a really specialist lens if I wanted to do that. I may have wanted to stay within the NHS or do private practice, or even if I wanted to go down more of a coaching route, I think that the knowledge that that initial medical degree would have given, I think would have given me a lot of benefits. And given the amount of studying that I've done, I wouldn't mind having the doctor in front of my name. So that's just a really silly vanity uh, reason as well. So I've got lots of reasons around that one. And the final bit there is just having the know-how to be able to sort of almost diagnose or look after yourself. That was the other reason why that was always a regret for me. So I don't know if that sparks any other thoughts for you. I'm sort of over it now. I have also looked at some of the things that I thought might be really rewarding about having that knowledge. And I've sort of, in my own way, gone down routes of study and analysis that have enabled me to have my own knowledge base. And the fact that the positive psychology's master's was in, uh, was looking at well-being, but just from a very different lens has also sort of supported me in that interest that I've always had. So yeah, do have a think about what your own regrets might be. You might be digging really deep and really having to think hard because you are mainly satisfied in your choices or like I said, it might be this kind of cloud that's been hanging over you. And so you're really waiting to get into this stuff today. 
So let's dive into what we can do with career regret and how we can harness it. And the final part of Daniel Gulati's article last week was that actually career regrets shouldn't be suppressed. They should hold a really privileged place in your emotional repertoire. And he has identified research that shows how powerful a catalyst for change regret can be. And that outweighs the short-term emotional downsides. There is a famed psychologist, Dr. Neil Rose, who recently stated that on average, regret is a helpful emotion and it can even be an inspiring one. But that does mean we need to articulate and celebrate our disappointments and understand that it's that's our capacity that we have to be able to experience regret deeply and learn from it constructively to frame our future success. And I wanted to zoom in on that. It's why I wanted to say out loud specific career regrets that I had and encourage you to do the same. Because with uncomfortable emotions, it is easy to go into avoidant mode as well, right? We can just say, look, that's uncomfortable. I don't want to go there. And that is a natural personality facet that some of us have, we will avoid discomfort. And this is my invitation to you to almost say, yes, there is some short-term discomfort in indulging in that exercise of saying, okay, what are the things that I would have done differently? And that, you know, why does that bother me? Why is that disappointing to me? There is an initial friction. There is an initial emotional cost to doing that. But it can really unlock and be so worthwhile. Um, And that's really what we're here to discuss today. So taking some of your regrets and holding them and almost examining them, you know, like you would an object in your hand and and distancing themselves uh, from you. You don't have to, you are not your own regrets. You can be detached from them. You can observe them. You can make sense of them and they don't have to consume you. So let's get into a couple of the practical things that we can do when it comes to career regret. So I'm switching over to this very recent article now in HBR that was published by Rachel Burgess, and it's called, Are You Hung Up on That Career Path That You Didn't Choose? They looked at 300 workers, they surveyed uh, more than 300 workers and their co-workers, and they did find that actually career regret was very common. In some cases, it could actually keep people from being fully invested and effective in their current jobs. But they also managed to come up with a few strategies that the research suggested were successful in warding off this type of rumination and dissatisfaction. So we're going to look at those. But to give a bit of context, they found that only 6% of their participants reported never or almost never thinking about other paths they could have taken. 21% reported thinking about these questions often or almost always. So definitely something which is affecting a big part of their participant pool. And this did have ill effect. It did result in people being less engaged, taking more breaks at work and even daydreaming more and engaging less with their colleagues. So it can, I guess, if unaddressed or if if it goes unchecked, it can have a detrimental impact on your current career. And the other thing that the authors note in this article is that this phenomenon of grass is greener is very much exacerbated by the online world and the choice overload that that can offer, both in terms of remote work and online applications making the world seem smaller and really adding to that overwhelm when it comes to the sheer number of available jobs, but also that FOMO effect that can be heightened on social media. And I know from my research that LinkedIn is the worst platform for social comparison. So when you go onto LinkedIn, you are highly likely to experience a form of social comparison. And it ties in with this idea that you are just bombarded with all of these alternate paths that you may have taken, lifestyles and places that you might have visited, um, as well as the actual specific careers. 
Now, the good news, of course, from this research is that we don't have to remain in this place, right? Yes, it's very common. Yes, it can impede us uh, from engaging fully in our work and therefore almost heighten our current dis- dissatisfaction. And yes, we want to be aware of how today's online world can really exacerbate this stuff. It's good to have that awareness. Now, a couple of things that we can do to address this. The first one is crafting your work identity. And what they found, the authors and those who carried out this study, was that the workers who practiced job crafting, i.e. they proactively shaped their roles to make their jobs more fulfilling, they were less withdrawn from their work and they were more likely to help uh, their colleagues. And even if they did feel some longing for alternative career paths, they were able to be more engaged in their day to day. And The beauty of career crafting, which is not a new concept to this article, is that there's always generally some way of bringing more of your passion and interest into your current role. So the authors cite the example of a social worker who sort of wished they'd become a vet, but actually they could use service animals to help those dealing with trauma. And so they could incorporate their love of animals into their job in a way which might make their job a better fit for them. Or a salesperson who gave up their career as a travel writer could actually expand into working with more international clientele and that way they could scratch their travel itch. So really thinking about those aspects of the job that you enjoy and the elements of your identity that still feel unfulfilled can help you to create a role that really works for you. And I've talked before about career capital, and I think this feeds really nicely into what Cal Newport talks about, which is that it's not often a huge, massive content shift of our jobs that we need. Over time, we develop autonomy in our roles, and this does give us more flexibility. And with that, we can then seek out those areas that are slightly more interesting to us or offer us lifestyle benefits. And that way, we have some control over what we're doing day to day, we don't feel quite so at the mercy of our past choices. And this actually leads to their second idea or their second strategy for addressing career regret. And that is to cultivate an internal locus of control. The research showed that even when external circumstances don't change, Shifts in internal perspective can make a big difference for the way that we feel and act. And those with what psychologists call an internal locus of control, what that means is that they view what happens to them as a result of their own actions rather than being sort of at the mercy of previous events and decisions. These people with this internal locus of control are more likely to respond productively to this yearning for a different path or that career regret. Instead, they can start to look at their current jobs and adapt those rather than sort of almost that destructive response of withdrawing and becoming disengaged. So cultivating that internal locus of control really, you know, can help and it starts with taking ownership of your past career choices. So then the focus becomes less on what of what could have been and instead remembering why at that time you made the decisions you did and then redirecting your energy to imagining what could be in the future and the steps that you could take to get there. They also like to chuck in here a bit of a gratitude. So really taking time to acknowledge the the things that you're grateful for in terms of your day-to-day job and the things that you really enjoy. And this doesn't mean that you just accept or tolerate unhealthy work environments or push your dreams aside, but it can help to reframe experiences and give us that perspective into the parts of our lives that do make us happy. So often people come to me and they, they feel stuck and they've lost that connection with what they actually love in their work and in their outside life even their kind of hobbies. They've lost that connection. And that's where the gratitude can start to become a really useful tool to elicit that stuff and draw it out. So in conclusion, what this article is saying is that it's very natural. If you've got career regrets, I guess you're not alone. It's such a natural thing. But what we want to do is we want to 
then employ strategies to address those so that we're not lost in that sea of what ifs. Um, and then we can move beyond that kind of grass is greener thing to actually seeking out proactive ways to improve our current circumstances. And that way we can embrace our own realities and we can become those creators of our own realities. And of course, this is something that especially when I'm doing 10-year visions with clients, we really work on and we really start with that vision. And sometimes there are shifts, there are paths that have been taken that feel like they might need a little bit of redirection and that's completely natural. So I guess to conclude, have a look at one of your career regrets or examine whether it's something you've been avoiding. Have you been avoiding even, you know, confronting your career regrets. And perhaps now look at them through a different lens and see what a useful signal they can be. And of course, this is something that I would be more than happy to discuss with you. I've got details in the show notes of how you can connect with me if you want to get into a little bit of this. And if you want to, if you feel that this is creating some stuckness for you, I would be more than happy to engage in a conversation on this stuff. So I hope that's been helpful for you and I look forward to connecting with you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Lifework with Maya. If you've got to this point, I'm guessing you found it valuable. So do share the link with somebody else who can benefit. In an age of materialism and us trying to stay on top of clutter, what could be nicer than to send a non-clutter digital link to somebody and say, I listened to this and I thought you might love it. What a great way to show your care and consideration for them. If you haven't left a review, now is the time and make sure that you are subscribed on Spotify or you're following along on Apple Podcasts. And if you really want to help the show grow, then do share the link on IG stories, Instagram stories, or reshare or discuss your thoughts with my LinkedIn posts. You can find me on LinkedIn and Instagram. Do feel free to send me messages there. I love having dialogue with my listeners um, and the links to those handles are in the show notes. Thanks for listening and I look forward to connecting with you next time. Bye-bye.